Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Biocompatibility of Medical Devices, Tests for Irritation. Our expert panel will discuss how in vitro models can provide a more accurate and cost-effective alternative to animal testing. We'll explore the types of in vitro human tissue models available and their applications in medical device testing. And our panelists will share their experiences using this technology and provide insights into the best practices for conducting testing. This webinar is being recorded and all registrants will automatically receive the recording after the presentation has concluded. And we're happy to welcome questions and encourage all attendees to submit questions to us throughout the presentation. And we will answer those questions during a Q&A session at the conclusion. It's my pleasure to introduce you, our panel to you today. First up is MATEC Scientific Director and Toxicologist, Dr. Christian Pellevoisin, joining us from France today. During his career, he's been involved in projects that led to the introduction of new reconstructed human tissue models and in vitro methods for evaluating the safety and efficacy of products in different industries, including cosmetics, medical devices, and pharmaceuticals. As chairman of the French AFNER Commission for Biocompatibility of Medical Devices and convener of Working Group 8 for Irritation and Sensitization of the ISO Technical Committee 194, he participated and conducted projects that led to the publication of the ISO standards 10993-23 for irritation and 10993-10 for skin sensitization. We are delighted to also have Dr. Andrew Wen, an advisor for PETA's International Science Consortium joining us today. Dr. Wen has a PhD in biology from the University of Vermont and several years of postdoctoral research experience at the University of Florida. Over the past four years, he's advised the Science Consortium on non-animal methods for testing food and medical devices and on the use of in silico models. Dr. Wen will discuss strategies in advancing MATEC's epivaginal test system through the FDA's Medical Device Development Tools Program. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Pellevoisin to begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Margot, for your nice introduction. And good morning, good evening to everyone. It's my pleasure to be to, with you today to speak about a subject uh, that is really important for MATEC. <clears throat> about uh, non-animal methods, uh, more ethical for toxicology in general, and more specifically today for biocompatibility of medical devices with a test for irritation uh, in the ISO 10993-23. First of all, uh, just to introduce quickly what are medical devices. Medical devices uh, covers a, a wide range of heterogeneous uh, products uh, but that have all in common that uh, they are intended to be used for medical purposes and that does not achieve uh, their principal action by pharmacological, immunological or metabolic means. This covers a, a wide range of different devices. World Health Organization estimates that more than 2 million of different uh, devices are uh, already on the market. And uh, in 2021, uh, more than 66 billion of units have been marketed. So a lot of, of products, and you can see on the picture that we are all concerned by uh, medical devices. It can be gloves, masks, uh, contact lens, uh, contraception, uh, implants, peacemaker, wheelchair, etc., etc. So the safety of this product is very, very important, and that's why they are a lot of, a lot of. In every country, you can find some law regulation that require that your uh, medical devices should be safe for the patient. The law, as always, requests but do not say how to perform and to demonstrate that your medical devices is safe, and that's why. Uh, the standards are very important in the industry and for regulators also because it gives a way you can demonstrate that uh, uh, you are uh, safe and for medical devices uh, this, these are the standards from the 10993 uh, series uh, around 36 different standards that are followed and that facilitate for the industry the demonstration of, of the biocompatibility of the medical devices the part one of this series is very important because it gives uh, how to evaluate and test uh, uh, within a management uh, risk management process. And in this part one, you have a 
this uh, famous table, which gives you all the different endpoints that you have to uh, assess, depending on your category of your medical devices, the nature of the contact with the body, and the duration. And you can see that you have different endpoints. What is important to see is that whatever the medical device is concerned, you always have to evaluate three endpoints, end cytotoxicity, which is uh, historically in 2D cell culture, but also irritation and sensitization that uh, uh, are many assessed historically on animal uh, testing. So today we speak more specifically about irritation. Uh, the, during a long time, the gold standard was the rabbit irritation essay, which has been uh, published in 1944 by uh, uh, Mr. Derez, so more than 80 years ago. Uh, this essay is based on application of uh, your medical devices or extract of your medical devices topically on the rabbit or by intracutaneous injection. This is specific to medical devices. You can inject one, uh, 200 microliters and after, during dif a different time point, you observe the reaction of the skin that can be erythema or edema. And from this, an expert will give a score, more or less red, more or less with an edema. And at the end, you calculate the primary irritation uh, um, index that can uh, allow to classify your, your product. This was the uh, uh, gold standard. From uh, history in uh, chemical, uh, where for the same chemical, you can have a lot of, of different uh, uh, dress tests that have been performed. We know, and everyone knows, that you, you can have a huge variability in the result. And that's why it's not so uh, uh, predictive of the human. And that's why it was important to replace this test. And this has been done in 2009, the first version of the OECD test guideline 439, which uh, um, was a method, a test guideline with an in vitro method, with a reconstructed human epidermis, validated as a full replacement of the rabbit. So for now, uh, 2009, no more uh, in vivo essay have been done for the uh, chemicals. How can we replace an animal by an in vitro essay? This is uh, uh, an important question, and I just want to give a quick overview about the philosophy, the strategy. Uh, it's based uh, in the OECD on what we call the adverse outcome pathway, which is a mechanistic approach. You can have some information from a chemical structure of your uh, product that you apply, and at the end, historically, what you observed in an in vivo essay on the apical effect, the health effect that you can observe for irritation, it's edema and erythema. But in fact, in the mechanistic toxicology, the point is to try to understand all the events that can arrive before you have this uh, adverse effect and to characterize uh, uh, this cascade of events for irritation, it's first the interaction of the chemical with the cells with, that can lead uh, to uh, uh, cell lysis, cell death. Uh, these cell deaths can uh, uh, induce the cascade of inflammatory uh, mediators that lead at the end of the uh, uh, adverse effect. And what has been demonstrated is that the cell death that you observe in your tissue is a good predictor of the appearance of the effect. And that's why in vitro, if you can mimic in a reconstructed skin this cell death, you can be able to predict what will happen in the animal or in the human. This is the basis of the uh, uh, validation of this uh, in vitro essay. And the big question we started to, to have in, uh, in the ISO technical committee under the impulsion of Dr. Kelly Coleman and, and Vin de Jong, at, at, uh, in 2009-10 was can we apply the OECD method to medical devices? And that's why uh, uh, a big studies have been performed uh, between 2013 and 2017 uh, in the aim of validate a modified OECD method 
based on reconstructed uh, human epidermis, uh, one from Matek, the epiderm, and another one from Episkin, the Skinetica Hashimoto. It was a huge uh, validation study, including uh, 17 laboratories uh, with uh, government, uh, governmental laboratories, university, CRO, industry, uh, medical devices company, with uh, 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 a blind study with different polymers spiked with irritant, and at the end, the conclusion was very good with a very high level of predictivity and reproducibility of this method that leads to publication of several publications. Uh, you can find it uh, on, on, on the web, it's open source, uh, and you can go and we can give you the reference if you want. So from this validation, in the ISO in 2021, we decided to write a new standard, the 10993, 23 specifically for irritation and in which the in vitro essay is the preferred method to assess the irritation of medical devices. The part 10 still exists but only for uh, skin sensitization. So what is a reconstructed human epidermis? It's important also to keep a, a word about this. A reconstructed human epidermis is an in vitro skin. Uh, it's constructed, is reconstructed by Matek for now more than 25 years, uh, based on human primary cells uh, that we uh, uh, seed in plastic insert. And after two weeks of culture in a defined medium, you can see that you have a morphology which is exactly the same that the normal human epidermis. You have different layers of basal cells with a proliferation, differentiation. Stratum spinosum, granulosum, and at the end, you have a stratum corneum. The, this uh, uh, essay on very performant, very predictive of uh, human uh, skin effect, and that's why these models uh, from Matek have been validated by, uh, uh, for several different applications, uh, for skin irritation, of course, of chemical, but for also for skin irritation of medical devices, but also for corrosion, for phototoxicity, and there is an ongoing validation at OECD also for genotoxicity with uh, 3D nucleus assay. And outside this uh, validated method, this model is used for a lot of, of different applications for drug development, cosmetics, etc. Epiderm model is uh, produced every week in a 24 well plates in, that we ship to our customers everywhere in the world in a, a solid medium of culture, You can see here that you receive by a, a transporter in your lab uh, the plates. Uh, when you receive the plates, you have to transfer the uh, insert in a fresh medium of culture in order to have a pre-equilibration pre before using it for your, for your experiment. I want to underline that this model are very, very easy to use very versatile. You can use it to uh, apply uh, liquids, uh, uh, but also solid. You can apply gel, cream, and whatever you want, exactly uh, in the same condition than the real situation. And that's why it's a very uh, powerful tool. Regarding the medical devices the protocol itself, uh, you know, it's simple, we can say. So day zero, When you receive a tissue, generally it's on Tuesday, uh, uh, because we ship on Monday, you receive a tissue, you transfer your tissue to a fresh medium of culture, and you do an overnight uh, pre-incubation uh, for equilibration of the tissue uh, after the uh, uh, transport. Day one, this is the day when you will perform your essay. Uh, for medical devices, the specificity is that uh, uh, you apply not the medical devices itself, but often an extract, an extract of the medical devices. According to ISO part 12, you have to extract your medical devices in a polar and non-polar. So at the end, you apply a mixture uh, containing more or less chemical with potentially some that can be uh, uh, irritant. The huge difference between OECD protocol and medical devices is that we apply 100 microliter compared to only 30 microliters for OECD. And also, we apply during a long time of exposure, uh, 18 hours compared to one hour for OECD. These are the main differences. At uh, the readout that we use to uh, uh, conclude on the uh, result of the experiment is based uh, 
on cell viability. And again, a very simple essay, it's an MTT essay that uh, every lab uh, can uh, perform uh, easily. The principle is that we use this molecule MTT in a solution. You transfer your tissue in this solution of MTT. The MTT, when you have uh, living cells, will uh, up, um, uh, be fed with uh, MTT and uh, the cells will reduce the MTT in a, a blue crystal, uh, which is non-soluble inside the cells. So you can see that you have a change of the color of your uh, tissues. After, it's very easy to transfer the tissue in a solution of isopropanol to extract the formazan, the blue colorant, from the tissue in order to do an optical density uh, measurement and to calculate the cell viability by comparing the control tissue, the coloration of control tissue, to the coloration of your treated tissues. From this, we have an algorithm of decision. If you have less than 50% of cell viability, your product, your medical devices, is irritant. And this should be in one solvent or uh, a two solvent, it depends. So very easy. Uh, uh, to implement. Regarding the uh, kit, uh, what Matex is proposing, we propose the uh, epiderm only, or you can uh, uh, request for a kit. The kit that we propose include not only the tissues, the living tissues, 24 uh, tissues, but you have also uh, the plates, uh, uh, the positive control, the SDS, and the protocol. And you can also, and we recommend that you use the MTT essay kit that we provide to uh, avoid any variability in the, in, in the MTT. But it's not mandatory to use this essay. Regarding the experimental plan, uh, you have to keep in mind that for each batch, each run you will perform, you always need to have some controls for every experiment. Negative controls in triplicate, all the experiments are done in triplicate, in triplicate. So you have a negative control, PBS, you have a positive control, uh, SDS 0.5% in uh, saline. And after you have also the two vehicle control, which are the two solvent vehicles that you use for extraction, saline, the polar one, and sesamoid, the non-polar one. And after you can start to test your uh, article. In remind that you need to test it in two uh, solvents. So for one article, one test article, you need six tissues. So with one plate, 24 wall plates, you can test two test, test articles. And that's why we recommend to, in one experiment, to pull the maximum of different articles to test it in only one run in order to have uh, the, same neg the same control for all of these test articles. So with two plates, you can test up to six different test articles. To sum up uh, the situation, before the new standard, uh, uh, part 23, the situation was that you have two big situations. Either you have an extractable medical devices, it means that it's a solid that you can't test as it, so you need to perform the extraction according to part 12. If your test article, your medical devices, is for an external contact, in this case, uh, uh, you performed the topical application in the rabbit. If your medical devices has a systemic exposure uh, by contact with the blood or breached skin or, or for an implant, you performed your, the intracutaneous rabbit essay. In case of your medical device, is it non-extractable? It could be a gel, a cream, droplets, or particulates, uh, uh, for external topical and for internal intracutaneous. For now uh, two years, since 2021, with the publication of uh, uh, part 23, no question, if you have an extractable, you go directly to the in vitro essay. You don't have to perform the uh, uh, rabbit essay. If you have a non-extractable uh, medical devices, the situation will be a case-by-case -case approach because in the validation we performed at ISO, we tested only polymers extractable, but we, don't, we didn't test the uh, non-extractable. 
Uh, but we know, and there are a lot of uh, publication, historical publication for cosmetics, but more recent publication for uh, some cream or gel or oil of medical devices, that you can use also the uh, uh, RHE models, but it, as it's not clearly written in the standard, it's a case-by-case -case approach, and it's better to discuss with your CRO to be sure that it can apply or to discuss with your notified body or your regulators for, for this situation. There is a third situation for the special irritation essay, which are medical devices in contact with uh, some specific uh, mucosa, such as uh, uh, the eye, vaginal, uh, uh, rectal, etc. In this case, the part 23 still recommend the animal, even if it says that you there are some 3D models that can be used, but as uh, uh, these specific medical devices were not, were, were not really part of the validation, we need to demonstrate that it can be used. So again, it will be a case-by-case -case approach. And considering this point, my colleague from uh, uh, Peter will say you more about this. There is some specific program at FDA, the uh, medical devices development tools, where there are some uh, uh, submission for some uh, specific uh, uh, special irritation essay uh, in order to gain acceptance uh, in the future. So for this essay, we have uh, uh, the ocular, for example, you can see the Annex D of the Part 23. Uh, what is important uh, to say is that for ocular, there are some OECD method validated, and we have uh, EPI ocular uh, model, which is validated in the, in the test guide for I2. So we can imagine in the future to have this uh, validating method also for medical devices. For oral mucosal uh, irritation, uh, what is recommended uh, in, in vivo is the Syrian Amster, uh, Amster uh, essay, but they are also 3D models of this oral uh, mucosoa. So again, we have some uh, research project and we can discuss further uh, during the Q&A session uh, in order to, in the future, be able to use these uh, uh, models for uh, medical devices in replacement of the animal. And we have also the vaginal irritation, which is inside the MDTD program that uh, my colleague uh, Andrew will, will present. Regarding the acceptance and recognition of, of the 10 nanometer free 23 the ISO standard are uh, worldwide. Uh, but depending on the country, some countries can uh, uh, recognize uh, totally or partially the standard. What is important to say is that uh, as soon as the standard has been published, and even before, in Japan, the MLHW published. Uh, the standard. So in Japan, it's accepted, fully accepted, the in vitro essay. The years in uh, 2021, the 10993-23 was the first standard uh, harmonized with the MDR in Europe. So in all the countries of Europe, again, no trouble to have acceptance and submission of, of a dossier with a, a in vitro essay. Uh, from discussion also uh, in the ISO, we know that uh, in South Korea it's accepted, in uh, Australia it's also accepted, in uh, uh, South America it can be accepted, and uh, uh, so the majority of the world uh, uh, accept the in vitro essay. Some countries for the moment are uh, more conservative and are, uh, do not accept totally the, the Part 23. This is the case of uh, you know, the US, uh, which recognize the Part 23, but partially, not the uh, in vitro essay, but we are quite confident about this uh, will evolve in the future, and they are also in the MDTT program, some discussion uh, in, in the US with uh, US FDA to submit uh, more data, uh, more uh, scientific data, rational to submit, uh, to support this uh, in vitro essay. There is also uh, with uh, Advamet a big uh, program to collect dual data in vivo and in vitro and, and to, uh, um, uh, to give this data to the US FDA also to convince to, uh, uh, to about the predictivity of the essay and to have uh, uh, this acceptance. 
So we are quite confident about uh, the, the change in the, in the future about this, and they are good discussion with the FDA uh, on this point. Important point, quickly, just a word about skin sensitization, uh, which is also very important for medical devices. This is the part 10, and uh, today the part 10 requests animal testing for medical devices. And in terms of number of animals, we can say that uh, this uh, uh, endpoint uh, is using the higher number of uh, animals in the medical devices area, more than all the others. And uh, the essay are based on guinea pig and, uh, and mouse, uh, the BULR, the GPNT, and the LLNA. The point is that uh, for now, uh, some years, we uh, in the OECD some test guidelines that uh, with uh, validated methods based on the adverse outcome pathway, this mechanistic approach, but I will not go in detail uh, about this. The important point is that this essay are not standalone. It means that you can't use it, you can't use only one skin sensitization essay in vitro to replace the animal. You have to combine two or three uh, in vitro and in silico approaches uh, uh, through what we call the defined approaches. And you can find a lot of information in the guideline line, uh, number uh, 497 about this. The important point is that. In the ISO for medical devices, uh, and especially in the working group eight, we started uh, three years ago uh, to discuss about how we can, in the future, uh, use this in vitro essay uh, uh, validated for chemicals for medical devices. And uh, there is an important document, which is a technical specification, which have been uh, uh, voted uh, in uh, March and accepted that should be uh, published soon that will allow to start some unromin study, as we have uh, done for irritation, to qualify some OECD method for medical devices in order to change uh, this also this, uh, this uh, uh, endpoint for medical devices. So to sum up, uh, I just want to say to you that uh, uh, now in vitro irritation essay for medical devices fully replace the uh, rabbit uh, irritation essay. Uh, the recognition of, of, of this uh, uh, in vitro essay are still in discussion in North America, especially US uh, and also Canada. And the applicability to non extractable is a uh, uh, case by case approach, even if uh, we uh, decided to discuss this also in October in uh, Arlington during the next uh, uh, ISO technical committee to start to discuss how to introduce uh, uh, this essay in the standard. For special heritage, we say there are uh, 3D models to the target of the target tissue that are available. So again, here we are continuing to work uh, on this at MATEC with uh, others in order to, uh, in the future, uh, facilitate the acceptance of in vitro essay for, for this test. And for skin sensitization, this is the uh, new frontier to reach uh, uh, for animal replacement. I thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, the question and answer will be at the end. And it's my pleasure now to uh, leave the floor to my uh, colleague from uh, PITA Science Consortium, Andrew Nguyen, uh, for uh, the his topic on vaginal irritation. So, Okay. Great, thank you, Christian. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, in full screen, if you can be on in presentation mode. Right. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Wynn, an advisor to PETA Science Consortium International. And our main goal at the Science Consortium is to protect human health and the environment by advancing modernized non-animal methods. And thank you, uh, Margo, for the introduction, Christian and Matt Tech for giving me the opportunity to speak here today and to share our experiences on medical device testing. Specifically today, I'll be discussing strategies and advancing Matt Tech's epivaginal test system through FDA's Medical Device Development Tools Program. 
And the focus of this talk is really part of the diverse activities of the science consortium to advance non-animal methods. Uh, in particular, we fund projects and also provide training through webinars and workshops. And we perform retrospective reviews to assess the current landscape of regulatory testing, which helps to identify opportunities to replace animal tests. And then we publish our findings from our various projects. And for more information, please feel free to follow the links through this QR code. Now, FDA's Medical Device Development Tools Program, or MDDT program, is a pathway for a non-animal method that can be used to assess medical devices, such as in the case of biocompatibility assessment, to be qualified or accepted by the FDA. The MDDT program is intended to facilitate and promote innovation of medical device evaluations. And there's no cap on the number of participants per project and really any developer, medical device sponsor, or other research organizations can voluntarily submit a proposal. As for us, the Science Consortium and the Institute for In Vitro Sciences, or IIVS, have been part of FDA's MDDT program since its inception in 2017. And in the initial years, FDA was still figuring out how this program could work for evaluating non-animal methods. And now the program has really settled into its current form as FDA has revised and updated its guidance for the MDDT. Nonetheless, along the way, we had the opportunity to engage in iterative feedback with the FDA, and we've incorporated their feedback into our test plan. And now we're on track to conduct a large portion of our testing the rest of this year. The program itself now has three phases, or sorry, two main phases, the proposal and qualification phase. The proposal phase involves submitting a complete test plan with some preliminary data that FDA can evaluate. And the goal of the proposal phase is to determine if the method is suitable for qualification through the MDDT. And then the qualification phase is the complete tool that incorporates FDA feedback from the proposal phase. And the goal is to determine whether the tool can be qualified for a specified context of use based on the evidence and justifications provided. <clears throat> now I'll go into more detail about this context of use part because it's uh, very important within this program. Our projects, generally through the MDDT, nicely follow this framework that's been published by a colleague in the Archives of Toxicology. This framework describes that iterative and ongoing process of establishing scientific confidence around new approach methodologies, or NAMs, or non-animal methods, and the key elements that accompany this iterative process. And the FDA MDDT program sits nicely at the independent review element, and they can provide feedback to guide the other elements of this framework. And one of the first steps in developing a new method and building scientific confidence around it is its human biological relevance, especially considering that the goal of biocompatibility assessments of medical devices is to protect humans. And the epivaginal test system offered by MATTEC is a human relevant model that is made up of reconstructed human vaginal cells into a 3D tissue structure. So the epivaginal test system mimics human biology and physiology. And we're developing the test system to assess vaginal irritation as per 10993-23 mainly within the product area of personal lubricants. Now, the next element of the framework I'd like to touch on is to assess the fitness for purpose of the non-animal method. And in this paper by Anna, there are a series of questions that fall under fitness for purpose, and there are two main questions that I think are relevant to share here today. 
The first is, what is the context of use? And this question is specifically stressed in FDA's MDDT program and refers to the, <clears throat> the decision point that's made on a set of products Um, on, on the set of products that the non-animal method can be used on. And this is because FDA assumes that the methods or new methods don't automatically work on all diverse types of medical devices. The context of use can be very broad, spanning multiple product codes within, for example, FDA's Top 10K database, or can be as narrow as a certain material type within a single product code. I should also mention that the MDDT can progress in stages where the context of use can be very narrow, and when the method is qualified, the context of use can then be expanded to encompass additional product codes through a series of smaller scale submissions. <clears throat> And we've opted to start from a more narrow context of use because it's more nimble and it's easier to generate a data package for uh, a few devices rather than multiple device classes. And for this vaginal irritation MDDT, we focused on personal lubricants within the product code NUC. And personal lubricants within the NUC product code are class two surface mucosal membrane contacting devices with very limited contact duration, so less than 24 hours. And as part of the context use, we need to know the endpoint that is being determined for the product class or classes. <clears throat> and from our interactions with the FDA, the main regulatory decision point revolves around determining whether these devices have an acceptable or not acceptable level of vaginal irritation. So we're setting out these labels to support regulatory decision making. The next critical question to answer to help guide the fitness for purpose is how will the uh, non-animal method be used? We're constructing a prediction model that integrates the epivaginal test system tissue data and chemical properties data from water-based personal lubricants which decides whether these devices have an acceptable or not acceptable level of vaginal irritation. And this approach is really putting a quantitative framework around variables that we think are interest for an endpoint. And this approach has been successful in other areas, such as the guard skin assay, which has received OECD approval for skin sensitization. And in guard skin's case, their variables of interest are, are genomic, whereas ours integrates chemical and tissue level information. Great, now that we have a human relevant system with a fleshed out fitness for purpose, does the epivaginal test system perform as we expect through our technical characterization? Remember that this framework is an iterative process and we'll have a more complete technical characterization by the end of this year. But what do we have so far? One of the first things we confirmed is establishing the grounds for measurement quality. And what you're seeing here are historical controls of the negative control on the top panel and the positive control on the bottom panel that have been established from 30 independent exper experimental runs by IIVS. And what this means is that when Future experimental controls, whether conducted in, in this lab or uh, external labs, falls within the historical range. Then the experiment is considered valid and can be used for regulatory decision making. The use of these historical controls sets the allowable range of variation within the assay and facilitates transferability within and among labs. We further produced preliminary data on personal lubricants and related products, which was commissioned through IIVS. And yes, the epivaginal test system ranks different levels of vaginal irritation. And what you're seeing here is that we measured uh, tissue viability across two time points 
which reflects the contact duration of personal lubricants. And what do we find? Lube 3 contains a sensate and has a higher irritation response compared to lubes 1 and 2, which don't have sensate. And products with a known irritant, that is minoxidil 9, had a larger irritation response overall compared to lubes 1 through 3. And minoxidil 9 was more irritating with longer exposure time, which really reflects the human clinical data and reinforces the human biological relevance of the system. Now we need to scale up the number of examples to parameterize the, per, the prediction model. Great, once we have all the data what, and, and we have the performance of our model, how do we know the performance is suitable for regulatory use? So it's very important to set up acceptance criteria for non-animal methods uh, or new approaches. And then this assume that current methods are 100% accurate or close to that, at least, which is definitely not the case. And when there is no human data to compare the method against, a suitable surrogate is to use the reproducibility of the animal studies as a benchmark for method performance, which is an approach in the publications by the EPA and NACEDL. For vaginal irritation, we're bridging the performance with eye and skin irritation tests because there's a lot of similarities, such as uh, rabbits are used across all these tests and tissues are scored. And what you're seeing here is the repeatability of the animal study, animal model, to itself for eye irritation, which is published by CAT from Johns Hopkins and colleagues, and skin irritation, which was published by Nicetum and colleagues. And what's initially striking is that the overall accuracy of these irritation endpoints is 83 to 88%, and not 100%, which is typically assumed. And both endpoints are consistent in that there is a greater confidence in a negative call than a positive call. And these performance metrics set up our acceptance criteria such that if our method falls within these ranges or, or better, then it should be accepted or qualified under the context of use. And what this means is that the method can be used essentially off the, off the shelf and FDA won't have to reevaluate the method for products that fall into a context of use. Now the strategies outlined today are generalizable to any advancement of non-animal methods. We highlight the process of method development through this published framework, and we offer three important aspects of technical characterization. This is definitely not exhaustive, and there are definitely additional points to consider. And this technical characterization was conducted on a human biologically relevant system, which is critical for assessing safety in humans. And ultimately, we want to build a method that satisfies regulators, which involves stating the context use explicitly and obtaining their feedback throughout the process of method development. And as part of building confidence in new methods, a key element is this independent review element. And FDA's MDDT program is a way to obtain the independent review that really matters, especially for wide-scale adoption of these methods. And again, the MDDT is a voluntary pathway for advancing non-animal methods in assessing medical devices for regulatory use. Vaginal irritation is one endpoint that is used in biocompatibility assessments. And there are many non-animal methods for other endpoints that would benefit from the MDDT program. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the MDDT process and whether your non-animal method would be suitable. We'd be happy to have a quick discussion and share our experiences in more detail. So you can connect with me through this QR code and yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much to Christian and Andrew for your presentations. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A portion now. We have several good questions uh, being posed in the chat, and I encourage all attendees to submit questions to us, um, and we will we'll get to all of them today. So the first question that we had come in is, does the RHE model apply also for medical devices that cannot be extracted, like gel or paste? That's a good question for Christian. Thank you, Margot. Yes, very good question. Um, my response, uh, my answer is definitely yes. After the question is, is does the Part 23 uh, covers this uh, type of medical devices? And this is uh, what I said, it's a gray zone. Um, we know that we can use these uh, non-extractable medical devices because uh, uh, there are several publications about this, because they, they are historical uh, use of the uh, epidermal model with uh, uh, cosmetics, for example, which are uh, some creams, some very close to a lot of, of medical devices, because they are some publication also uh, where some non-extractable medical devices have been spiked with uh, some irritant to demonstrate that the uh, uh, in vitro essay is uh, performant. But as I said, it's a case-by-case case now of, uh, approach. Uh, I know that in, with some notified body in Europe, in some countries, you can, uh, uh, you can support the use of uh, in vitro with this product, especially when you have a very good knowledge about the, your chemical characterization of your medical devices. Could be the case maybe in, in FDA. I, I could, uh, but it's a case by case. The next step will be to uh, uh, change the uh, part 23 to clearly uh, integrate this uh, uh, applicability to non acceptable medical devices. But for this, we, we need to have uh, uh, more experimental data, to have a uh, uh, scientific discussion in the ISO World Group in order to find the consensus to change the standard uh, uh, for this. So, sorry not be able to say yes or not it's yes but depending on the situation i hope thank that you, uh, answer right. <laughs> thank you christian um okay another question is um i think this question is asking if they can perform this assay with porous absorbable biomaterials uh, if I may, uh, I, I, I can answer if you want complete, uh, uh, Andrew, you can. Uh, the, 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 the question about porous and absorbable uh, materials, I think it's nearly the same that for animal, for example, uh, the classical animal testing. It depends if you want to do an extraction or to test your product uh, as it. If you do uh, an extraction of your product, uh, after you can apply directly the in vitro essay, no trouble. If you want to test your product as it, uh, 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 with no extraction, uh, we 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 are in the situation of uh, of uh, non extractable medical devices, and it will be a case by case. Technically, it's totally applicable. Uh, after, it's just the interpretation of uh, ISO uh, by the regulators. So I say again, yes, you can, but it depends of your specific situation. Thank you, Christian. Another um, question for you, um, is the skin irritation test for medical devices accepted by the US FDA? Uh, who asked the question? I want a name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, the job. Uh, no. For the moment, not. But uh, uh, there is very, very uh, uh, constructive uh, discussion inside the ISO, outside ISO at the MDTT uh, level, uh, especially in US. There is uh, Kelly Coleman from Medtronic, uh, who is uh, highly involved in, in this acceptance of uh, in vitro essay, and he submitted to FDA the MDTT program for the M dossier for uh, irritation uh, and. Uh, very constructive uh, uh, discussion, and uh, we can anticipate that uh, in the future it will be accepted. 
but today it's not accepted. Right, and we do expect that these things will be changing with the recent passage of the FDA Modernization Act, which is empowering uh, researchers to use non-animal methods. Um, I agree, fully agree. Uh, I think it's very important, this uh, high-level position uh, of uh, FDA. Uh, it's also an important parameter that can uh, facilitate in the future acceptance, in a, in, in a close future, I hope. Yes, we all hope. Um, another question for you, Christian. What is the regulatory status of Part 23 all over the world? I said the world uh, inside my presentation. Uh, I, I would say the 80% of the world, uh, except uh, clearly US and Canada. Uh, in some countries, I, I don't have the information. And during our last ISO meeting, uh, we, we do a sort of uh, uh, a survey about this I, we discussed and I am uh, waiting for some feedback uh, uh, for in Australia for example um, it's accepted but there is no official recognition but it's accepted uh, in vitro because Australia never officially recognized ISO standard but it's accepted a very very important uh, uh, news was uh, in China uh, China uh, is uh, generally uh, requesting animal, uh, even for cosmetics, uh, during a long time. But for medical devices, they uh, now fully recognize the uh, Part 23, and they uh, published recently the, uh, the GB standard. GB is the national standard organization in China, the GB standard for the Part 23 with uh, in vitro. So even although China is accepting the in vitro data in their country. So uh, it's largely accepted in the world. Uh, another question, are there any efforts to validate an in vitro method for oral irritation based on reconstructed tissue models? Yes, totally yes. And uh, uh, at the last I thought we submitted a very good uh, poster. We can send it to you, do not hesitate to ask, uh, presenting the last uh, data we generated. And uh, they are in South Korea, also some good publication and work uh, on, uh, on this in Japan. Uh, and uh, so I say, yes, this is very advanced. And uh, again, uh, the way is, the, the big, the complexity is that for irritation and skin sensitization, they are validated methods for chemicals from OECD, uh, that have been validated by EGVAM in Europe, by JAGVAM in, in Japan, by IGVAM in, in, in the US. So they are validated and the question is uh, to assess the applicability to medical devices. For oral irritation, for example, as for vaginal irritation, there are no validated methods in the OECD because for chemicals, they don't care about oral and, 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 and vaginal. So it's more complex uh, uh, to uh, gain the acceptance by regulators. And this is the subject that we will discuss during the next uh, 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 ISO technical committee in, in uh, October in the US. Uh, uh, we put this uh, thematic to the agenda to discuss how we can integrate this in vitro essay for uh, oral, uh, vaginal, uh, and all the special irritation essay. So yes, we are working at Matex specifically, but other teams in the world are working also on this. So I'm quite confident uh, that we can have it in, in the future. And again, on a case by case approach, and we can uh, uh, discuss about this if you have a specific, specific need, uh, we can imagine that a, a product developed with a very well known chemical characterization, sometimes with a predicate uh, already on the market, we can have in case-by-case case approach, an acceptance with in vitro data only. Thank you, Christian. And another one for you. Um, could you clarify the applicability, validity, and acceptance of the in vitro irritation models to replace the, the intracutaneous re reactivity test for devices in contact with more sensitive tissues? And let me know if you need me to repeat that. Um, that's an important question. I don't know. Yes, 
I, I added, uh, I, I have some uh, slide in Annex. You can see my slides? Uh, no, you can change, you can reshare your screen, I believe. Ah, I have to share my screen. Maybe, uh, montrer mon écran. Okay. You see my screen. Yes, you see it now? Yes, we can see. Uh, during the validation, the qualification for irritation, uh, we published a lot of, of, of teams working on this, and they are a lot of, of publication, including this six publication with a, a demonstration of the performance of a, a, a reference material used in animal with animal data and in vitro data have been uh, published. And it has been demonstrated for the specific uh, uh, situation of intracutaneous compared to, toxic, uh, to topical that the epidermese was very, very uh, predictive. Why? Because first, the uh, uh, RHE models uh, have a barrier, uh, uh, um, a very low barrier compared to uh, human uh, skin. Uh, it's uh, nearly 30 to 50 lower uh, skin barrier. It means that you, when you apply something, and if you wait sufficiently long time, you will have this contact at the end. And that's why with this lower barrier and this long time of exposure, you, you, you are very close to the situation or, or of your, uh, where your product will be in contact with the living cells, exactly as for intracutaneous essay. And this has been demonstrated by a, a parallel study in vivo and in vitro with different polymer uh, irritant uh, at different concentration where a patch test has been done in the rabbit and intracutaneous essay. And you, you can see that intracutaneous in, in vivo is more sensitive than a, a, a topical application. And when you compare to the in vitro RHE essay, you can see that the in vitro is as performant, as predictive than the intracutaneous uh, essay. And that's why uh, the method has been validated for medical devices, not only for topical, but also for intracutaneous uh, essay. Regarding the type of uh, uh, tissues, it's considered that uh, irritation uh, uh, is based on the same mechanism uh, when we speak about mechanistic, you have this interaction of the irritants with the cells that lead to the development of the irritancy. It can be a keratinocyte, it can be a muscular cells, it can be other cells. So that's why also this in vitro essay is considered a, a predictive of any type of irritation. But for this point, it's exactly as for animal, for example. Uh, when you do an irritation essay in the rabbit, uh, it's uh, not only for uh, uh, medical devices in contact with skin, it's for medical devices in contact uh, in any type of tissue in your body. So this, this is not the reason why this in vitro essay is considered uh, 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 as a replacement, not only for topical and for intracutaneous and for any kind of uh, um, extract of medical devices. I hope that uh, this answer to, to the question. This is another Thank you, question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a good question here that um, I think would be a good question for, for Andrew. Um, could you please describe the challenges in using animal-free methods? So it was the question, uh, describe the challenges in using animal-free methods? Yes. Yeah, I think one of the major challenges is um, that the gold standard is that animal model typically, but what we really want to do is compare the in vitro methods or animal-free methods with a human relevant model. And when there's no human, data that can be challenging. But for skin sensitization, for example, there's a lot of great human data there and it's not a challenge there. Uh, for vaginal irritation, we don't 
necessarily have um, vaginal irritation for humans, but what we do have is um, human patch skin uh, testing, which is also a suitable a, a, a suitable method for assessing uh, the irritation endpoint and, and 510k submissions. So we do have a, a, a little bit of comparisons there that that we can make. But yes, so just to answer the question originally, uh, the, the challenge is uh, ensuring that the that there's human biological relevance, and there are different strategies to establish that. Yeah. Yes, the translatability is typically something that we hear a lot um, about as, as challenges uh, for using the technology. Uh, thank you well, for that. Well, if I may, this is a very exciting question and complex question because we never had this question about acceptance of animal because you need to keep in mind that animal is a model of human. It's not human but it's a model that has never been validated and that has been used during 80 years, but it, it's accepted like this. The trouble now is that when we want to replace the animal, we need to demonstrate that uh, in vitro is uh, 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 predicting. And the second point, very important, I, I think is that with animal, we are, uh, we are observing what happened. We are not understanding what happened, we just observe, does my animal on, on, on dead or uh, is there irritation or is there a cancer? With in vitro, it's a new paradigm in toxicology. It's a new way to do the toxicology. And uh, you need to, uh, this is, these are the adverse open pathway, you need to have basic research to know what are the predict, how you can predict this, the uh, terminal uh, effect. And this is also, uh, uh, this is why there is a, a, a resistance to, to the change about this, because it's a new way to perform the toxicology. And that's why education is very, very important. Education uh, uh, of uh, toxicologists, uh, students, to be uh, prepared to accept this new approach of, and this new uh, way to perform uh, uh, toxicology. Thank you both for that for that answer. That was a very important question. Um, another good question: uh, What is the strategy to follow in case of a false positive or false negative result? For the irritation, false positive or false negative, uh, I, I would say that uh, it would be the same than uh, uh, with animal. <laughs> The question uh, would be the same with animal if you have a false negative or false positive. Uh, uh, what I can say is that the, the, what we try to, the, the protocol has been designed to be the most sensitive possible. Uh, again, with 18 hours of exposure, uh, uh, we want to be sure that majority, if it is not all the product, irritant product, product can be detected. Uh, in case of borderline result, or if you have a doubt mm -hmm. about uh, the results, uh, uh, you can also use uh, a second endpoint. I, I didn't say the, a word about this, but you can use a, a cytokine a quantification that can, if you have a borderline, that can confirm if it is negative or not negative. It, it can be helpful, and uh, in the protocol, you have uh, the information about this. That's why we say always keep the medium of culture and to freeze it in case or you, you want to assess the cytokine uh, uh, and to quantify to confirm your result or not. But uh, again, it's experimental procedure, so you, uh, uh, you can't be sure 100% always that uh, uh, you have a right uh, uh, information. But again, when you perform, uh, when you do your, your risk assessment for medical devices, you have a combination of different essays, you have a, a, 
uh, cytotoxic uh, uh, essay, you have uh, irritation, you can perform, you can imagine that uh, you can perform implantation, uh, you can have some clinical studies, and based on all, you do your risk assessments and, and, uh, and you have also the chemical characterization. So irritation is, is a part of your risk assessment. We are confident about the results, but it's not alone, it's based on a, a global toxicological approach. So Christian, what you're essentially describing is like a weight of evidence approach. Irritation yeah. is just one piece, and there, it's an opportunity to take uh, a deep dive into those false negatives or false positives and find out what's really going on and additional information would help. Yeah, I agree with you. Thanks. Thank you both. We have so many good questions. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them in the time, but we're going to try and get through as many as possible. But I just wanted to let everyone know that um, if we aren't able to answer your question during this call, we will follow up afterwards with an answer for you. Um, another question, are there plans to incorporate the testing of non-extractable medical devices on the ISO standard? Uh, yes. Yes, when and how, it's difficult to say <laughs> because it's a step-by-step -step approach. And, 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 uh, but uh, yes, definitely uh, we need to have it uh, in, in the standard. Uh, at the ISO, uh, we, uh, uh, all these subjects are discussed at, at, uh, in, in the working group eight. Uh, this last month, we focused a lot about skin sensitization because it's important. But as I told, the uh, uh, next meeting uh, we will have in Arlington, uh, the point is to discuss uh, 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 these different uh, essays uh, to see how we can uh, include it and uh, what will be the requirement to, to be able to include it in, in the Part 23. Uh, I have no date about this, but uh, this is one of the important subjects that uh, we have in mind for part 23. And kind of a follow-up to that question, are there any other ISO 10993 endpoints other than cytotoxicity, irritation, sensitization, or genotoxicity that could be addressed using in vitro methods? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, one one of the areas we're working on through the MDDT is pyrogenicity. So the monocyte activation test is a superior method compared to the rabbit pyrogen test. There is a MO compatibility also on some project. Uh, uh, so on different area, yes. Okay, um, another good question. Um, what about absorbable polymers? Uh, for example, different concentrations of collagen that could be tested, um, complex mixtures of PVC leachables will often have DEHP, ESBO, and cyclohexanone, but most of the assay development only uses single chemicals. What about intracutaneous? Um, I try to find the question because what is the question? Uh, what about absorbable from different concentration? It could be what about complex mixture of PVC to move off an FDA cyclohexanone, but most of us are single cube. About an intracutaneous essay, I already uh, answered. Um, uh, showing that uh, uh, during the validation study at ISO, we performed in parallel some studies uh, by topical application, by intracutaneous, with different concentration of extract of, uh, of polymer. So we are quite confident about the uh, predictivity. Uh, after regarding for some uh, injectable specific uh, based on uh, 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 collagen or, or, or others, um, when you perform an intracutaneous essay in the rabbit, uh, what you observe is the irritancy, but it's also, also the mechanical effect linked to the injection 
Uh, I am thinking for a dermal filler, for example, that can be tested. Uh, sometimes you can have a positive answer, uh, intracutaneous, not because your product is irritant itself, but because mechanically, when you inject uh, your, 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 your polymers, uh, you have a, 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 an irritancy. So effectively, this is difficult, difficultly uh, uh, observable or, uh, on 3D models, but it's very specific. Uh, linked to the context of use uh, of your products. But for intracutaneous essay, again, uh, we have a lot of, of data, experimental data, uh, showing a good correlation between the in vitro and, and, and what, uh, what, what exists. But the big trouble uh, for this uh, demonstration uh, is that uh, you don't have any medical, uh, in general, medical devices positive on the market. So as soon as you want to demonstrate that your essay, and it's true for skin sensitization, for other endpoints, uh, that your essay, in vitro essay, is uh, as performant or better performant than the animal, you don't have reference product because you don't have positive uh, control. So that, that's complex. Um, and also when you discuss with uh, the industry, uh, especially for skin sensitization, for example, 90, 90, 95 of uh, in vivo essay on negative. For irritancy, 80 uh, percent of uh, essay on negative. So as soon as, uh, for example, for dual data uh, that uh, Kelly Coleman is, is collecting, he collected from different companies uh, for FDA, uh, nearly 200 dual data coming from uh, different companies. So data, uh, medical devices that have been tested in vivo and in vitro, uh, but 99% of the products are negative. Uh, so that's complex. We try to, and Matex is really invested in this, to generate data in vitro with different type of products to uh, uh, collect the maximum of historical data and to compare. But it's sometimes it's quite impossible to demonstrate, and that's why what said uh, Andrew, what is very important is, is the way of evidence, the science-based approach where we need at the certain point uh, to to believe in science uh, and not only to believe in animal data. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, we are pretty much out of time today. We wanted to let everyone get a, get on with their day. Um, but if we did not get to your question during the presentation or the Q&A session today, we will, of course, follow up with you. Um, and I wanted to thank you all for spending some time with us today. And we hope you found this information um, presented today valuable and informative. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters and especially our guest presenter, Dr. Wen, for joining us today and sharing their expertise. All registrants will receive a recording of this webinar by email, and it will also be available on Matech's YouTube page. Um, please join our email list and follow us on LinkedIn to stay up to date on in vitro testing developments, and we hope to see you all again at our next webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>